Hello. It's an honor to speak with you today. Thank you to CTIA for welcoming me back again this year. Last year, when I joined you, I had just been named as the CEO of U.S. Cellular, and I've now recently celebrated my one-year anniversary. We've gone through a lot of changes over the past year, but I'm happy to say that our company's mission remains consistent, and that's to connect people and communities to what matters most to them. Connection will always be at the heart of our mission, and with 5G networks becoming the norm, we're dedicated to ensuring we support our customers in providing them with the most advanced connectivity possible, with a special focus on underserved communities. Now, I'd like to talk to you today about a concept that's vitally important to our company, and one that I believe will become critical to our country's further progress, and that is a focus on local connections. At its heart, networking is a local business. Our customers expect to be connected consistently and reliably wherever they live, work, or play. Nationwide claims sound good in an advertisement, but at the end of the day, a customer's experience in their local community is what matters, and they need their wireless provider to elevate their local experience to get the most out of it. Whether that's checking a reservation for dinner with friends, finishing homework on the way to school, or attending a virtual work meeting, we need to be there for them. And this need for local connection has only been highlighted by the ongoing pandemic. People have adapted to a new normal, which relies heavily on unrestricted connectivity. Everyday tasks have moved from being something that had to be done face-to-face -to, -face to something that is natural, even expected to be done virtually. It would be natural to think this has caused a shift from mobile to fixed connections. As people stay home, stay local, one would expect that usage of mobile networks would slow. But just the opposite has been the case. Year-over-year -year data usage on our network jumped nearly 50% from the time the pandemic started to the end of 2020. Our customers may be staying local, but they're using connections, and particularly wireless connections, like never before. Now, unfortunately, this heightened local network experience is not indicative of what every customer on every network has experienced. Broadband Now estimates that there are nearly 42 million Americans who do not have reliable access to wired or fixed wireless broadband connectivity. And with remote working and learning and telehealth thrust into daily routines and part of the new normal, millions of Americans are at a severe disadvantage. Without consistent connectivity, engaging in digital life can be a hassle, with people in extreme circumstances having to drive to coffee shops and libraries or local restaurants with Wi-Fi to complete their daily routines or their classes. And this has driven working adults to work longer hours, and it's blurred the line between working hours and non-working hours. For students, this has had a direct impact on their education. Michigan State studied the effects and found students with unreliable internet access scored on average a half grade point lower than students who had reliable internet. And this was reiterated during our research conducted with donors choose over the summer. After polling groups of parents, we discovered one in four believed their child experienced a lapse in their education and believed they would need to take summer classes to bridge the gap. This is tough to hear. Children will invent our future, and they deserve unrestrained access to education so they can take on the challenges of tomorrow. And strong local connectivity must be a key enabler. To aid in supporting this, we've donated nearly 3,000 hotspots to bridge this divide and help students stay connected to their teachers. But that's just scratching the surface. We must work as an industry, as a country, to guarantee hardworking Americans equal access to affordable, high-speed local connectivity. And we've put all the resources of our company behind supporting this effort. We've rebranded ourselves as America's locally grown wireless. And those of you that live and work in our network footprint will have seen our message of building a network by locals and for locals. We've reorganized ourselves regionally so we can adjust our network modernization, our distribution, our promotions, and our sponsorships for the needs of the local community. The needs of Kearney, Nebraska are different from the needs of Janesville, Wisconsin, or different from the needs of Kingwood, West Virginia. Why take a nationally generic approach when it's local connections that matter? We've even taken a local approach to our return to office protocols after COVID. We've traditionally been an in-the-office kind of company, but the pandemic has caused all of us to reset our expectations about how work gets done and where it gets done. 
Our team has done an incredible job in serving our customers and maintaining productivity. And we, like our customers, must learn lessons from the pandemic and adjust accordingly. We're empowering our local managers to make the decisions needed on where and when their teams need to be in the office. We're focusing on coming into the office on purpose and for a purpose. And we believe it'll help us be more nimble, efficient, and effective in serving our customers' local needs. So at US Cellular, we're focused on local connections. And I strongly believe that this local approach should also help to inform our country's approach to supporting and funding infrastructure. State and federal governments should be looking for local approaches to provide connectivity. Stated differently, we have to build a locally guided strategy, not a technology guided strategy. Now, what do I mean by this? A locally guided approach evaluates the specific situation in a specific geography, from customer density to topography, things like hills, mountains, foliage. It evaluates existing competition and existing commitments in the local area. And then it structures the best combination of technologies to serve that geography with competitive speeds. It's a complex technology picture, but it results in a simple outcome, the best possible speeds at the lowest cost and the fastest deployment time. In contrast, a technology-guided approach may feel less complicated as a strategy, but it results in a much more complicated outcome, and a more expensive outcome, and a more time-consuming outcome for users. Let's use ubiquitous fiber as an example. Some have been using the phrase future-proofing to paint a world where every home and business across the country is connected with fiber. But if you spend any time at all in rural America, and I spend a lot of time in rural America, you realize that connecting every home and business with fiber doesn't meet local geographic and cost realities, and you risk losing widespread adoption because of the time that would be required to deploy. Let me be clear. Any approach that you take to connect under and unserved areas will absolutely require deep fiber buildouts, much deeper than we have today. But they will also require other technologies to bridge the last mile in a cost-effective and a timely manner. Now, there are several options for this last mile connectivity. Fiber where it's feasible. Satellite may eventually prove to be technically and financially feasible. But we believe that fixed wireless will provide a strong combination of speed and affordability while also enabling stronger mobile service everywhere that we install infrastructure. We already have a significant number of customers connected with fixed wireless via LTE. And deploying that technology has helped raise broadband connectivity significantly in underserved areas of the country. And we believe that 5G can really be a game changer in this area, especially when we consider that 39% of respondents to a Deloitte Technology Trends survey said they would be willing to forego current home internet service to utilize 5G fixed wireless access as their main source of connectivity when available. Now, we're well along with our trials on 5G home internet access, and we're doing a variety of local tests so that we can properly serve customers. In fact, we're running trials in those same localities I mentioned earlier, Kearney, Nebraska, Janesville, Wisconsin, Kingwood, West Virginia. And if you haven't heard of those towns, that's sort of the point. We need to be developing connectivity solutions where it's geographically hard, not where it's easy. And our trials have delivered impressive results. We've been partnering with Ericsson, Nokia, Insego, and Qualcomm Technologies. And our most recent trial achieved a world record range of more than six miles at speeds of nearly one gigabit per second. Now, the actual speeds may vary a little bit when we take geographical nuances into account, but it shows that fixed wireless has the potential to meet customer demand. Now, we're going to need considerably denser tower builds to fully deploy this technology. And those towers will need to be connected with fiber. So I'm still a big fan of dense fiber. But fixed wireless provides a much more cost-effective and timely approach than trying to cover every square mile of rural America with fiber. So if we focus on a locally guided approach to connecting Americans, there are three principles we believe should guide funding efforts to maximize the number of Americans benefiting from broadband infrastructure investments under this new congressional legislation. First, avoid unnecessary subsidies of projects that are already happening or are already committed. From M&A promises to the RDOF process to requirements associated with spectrum acquisition, Many commitments have already been made to connect unserved and underserved America. 
Supporting funding for projects under this forthcoming program that are going to occur regardless is duplicative, and it stifles the ability for meaningful innovation to occur. Policymakers need accurate maps of existing coverage, and those maps should also indicate prior commitments around coverage or capacity enhancements. Second, let the most cost-effective combination of technologies win. The infrastructure proposal passed by the Senate establishes a reasonable speed threshold, and importantly, an asymmetric speed threshold. Now, just for clarity, asymmetric means that your target for downlink speed is significantly greater than your target for uplink speed. The current thresholds in the bill are 25 megabits per second downlink versus 3 megabits per second uplink for unserved areas, and 100 megabits per second downlink and 20 megabits per second uplink for underserved areas. It's important to keep this asymmetric threshold because it allows for robust competition. Satellite, wireless, cable, we all need to architect our networks around asymmetry because that's how customers use it. The average customer uses 10 times as much downlink as they do uplink. So policies should reinforce asymmetric speeds and then encourage the most cost-effective solution for local needs. And that will almost certainly require a variety of different technologies. If fiber can be built in a timely and cost-effective manner, we should absolutely do so. Fixed wireless can then provide an effective and timely way to fill in the gaps where fiber doesn't make sense from a cost or timing perspective. Third, and finally, enable mobility. Expanding 5G to unserved and underserved areas is immensely important for the mobile lifestyle that Americans demand today. And that's all Americans, not just urban Americans. Customers don't want to be tied to their home, they want to be mobile. Study after study shows that Americans would first give up their home internet connection instead of their mobile phone. But that isn't a trade-off that anyone should have to make. To enable mobility, investment needs to be made into cellular infrastructure towers, radio, spectrum. And the use cases of tomorrow are mobile. Drones, autonomous cars, healthcare sensors, smart robotic manufacturing, intelligent agriculture. And Americans are voting with their wallets, even in very normal use cases. When it comes to receiving FCC emergency broadband benefits, nearly seven out of 10 households are opting to utilize mobile services rather than fixed broadband. And the great news? is that if you invest in denser fiber and fixed wireless access, those same investments facilitate 5G mobile connections. It's a double benefit. Local high-speed home broadband and mobile 5G access. So if we're able to follow those three principles, identify and hold people to their prior commitments, invest in a locally guided strategy that lets the best and most cost-effective technology win, and enable mobility, we will truly be ensuring our future. We'll be ensuring dense fiber connections to not only connect homes and businesses, but also to connect cell towers to provide mobility for Americans wherever and whenever they need it. This combination of fiber and wireless can ensure consistent and comprehensive connections for all Americans, and finally make a meaningful dent in bridging the digital divide. U.S. Cellular is committed to this local vision and we are putting all of our resources to work to make sure we can bring it to life. Not just from a local network perspective, but also in terms of our brand approach and how we serve our customers. We look forward to working with everyone in the industry and with local governments to make this a reality. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you again this year. 